Hey, look, it is Tuesday. Uh, we are, well, this is Trekland HQ, I do believe. And we are live. What did you do in the Star Trek hiatus? Episode 311, 311 of Trekland Tuesdays Live. There we go. With me, Dr. Trek, Larry Demichek, coming at you this week, as always, from here, the heart of Trekland through Portal 47 via the Trekland Treks for some sanity, clarity, and the big picture in all things Star Trek. This week, presented by the Kickstarter program for Destiny Aurora from our good friend Frank Zanka. Tell you more about that in a minute. I am so glad to have you with us today. It's another Tuesday. If you're new to Trekland Tuesdays Live, you got to check out the chat. That's that's where it's happening right now for a minute or two. We've got veteran TTLers in there, but however you came to us, welcome, welcome. I look forward to maybe chatting with you in a bit. First, we will have, okay, a little topic for me this week, kind of a grab bag, but we're going to make a, we're going to go around the horn here at Trek World a little bit because it is hiatus time and we've only got about 10 more days another week basically a week from this thursday is the return debut season two of strange new worlds the much ballyhooed increasingly so now that the screeners are out with six episodes so you're going to see all kinds of chatter out there the trailer has already garnered a lot of chatter so that's happening but again, we just got through six, seven weeks of hiatus time. Uh, a few things have happened. I uh, thought we would just, you know, go around the horn and see what's going on. But first off, you should know, I will be on that for a little bit. Then we'll take a quick break. We'll look at some Parrot Analytics ratings for some Star Treks, maybe go afield of that a little bit. And then I'll dive into the chat. And you should know that if you're on Facebook, you're only going to see the Facebook chat in chat. If you're on YouTube or Twitch, you're going to see it all. Just saying. And we've got TTLers that enjoy going to all the platforms. Just told them. You know, it's been a long time since anybody, any um, pre-Gen Zers uh, bopped through the chat and sounded off. And we had, you know, Twitch patrol over there trying to keep things calm just because it's not, it doesn't present on Twitch the way the Twitchers are used to seeing. Uh, at least the old days, you know, like a year ago, two years ago. So no, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, I do want to thank a uh, shout out this week to um, my friend Frank Zenka, and I want to tell you about his Kickstarter. So we are sponsored this week by the Destiny Aurora Kickstarter. Here is a great video I want you to see right now. Immerse yourself in the wildly successful Destiny Aurora universe. The release of the audiobook version marks the newest addition to the franchise. Follow the thrilling adventures of the starship Destiny Aurora and its crew as they hunt for the alien assassin who murdered Jace Carver's wife. Their epic confrontation will change Jace's life forever and keep readers guessing till the end. Go to the link below and listen to the first chapter absolutely free. All right. Did you catch that? <laughs> no, I'm very, very thankful to Frank. So here's, it's a Kickstarter. They've already made their goal, but they are uh, into stretch goals. It's a, it's a complete series. He's done the comics. He's doing a collected graphic novel. There is an audio book there. Well, you can see all the perks uh, at the site. I'm going Immerse to, that's the video. Here we go. Want to show you off just some of the artwork, some of the major characters. Uh, the, wow, do we have everyone still? I've never had that happen. The live stream shut down. But as I was saying, I want to make sure everybody was able to see these uh, these great images of artwork from some of the major characters, Destiny Aurora, um, and back again. Anyway, check it out. Check out the Kickstarter. Uh, it's got some time to go, but uh, Frank's been around a while. Uh, I got to know Frank, especially before, but especially during the Nichelle Nichols Foundation, uh, the Nichelle Nichols Farewell event a year and a half ago. Um, there we go. Uh, check it out, please. The uh, Let me see.
Right. We'll be posting the, we'll post the link to the, uh, well, it's, you know, Kickstarter, Destiny Aurora. And we will post the, uh, well, you know what? I've got it here. Hold on just a sec. We'll post the link. How about that? In a bit. Uh, here, I can do it right here. It's live, everybody. It's live. Boom. They're in your chat. Oh, and uh, Scott beat me to it. So there we go. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you, Frank. And everyone check that out. What was I saying? What did you do in the Star Trek hiatus? Well, look, uh, we've had eight, six, seven long weeks here between the end of Picard. And you know what? There was plenty of ballyhoo for Picard. So lots of marinating in the joy that that was that. Slight minority of folks didn't appreciate it as much as it seemed like the vast bulk of fandom did. And now... One thing that's going on is you're seeing Emmy considerations, the FYCs, the four-year consideration, the Emmy voters, especially here in LA. Billboards going up, uh, Terry, Day Blast, a lot of folks, all too happy. Jerry, Patrick, whoever's socials you're following, all too happy to share the billboards and all of that because that's what's happening. And will it just be for technicals again? Will Sir Patrick get an Emmy nomination for acting? We will see. Will the series get an Emmy nomination for series? We'll see. But that's happening right now. So some folks are spending their hiatus time promoting Picard. But a lot of fans and others and professionals are looking forward to Strange New Worlds in another week or so. That's going on. But, you know, around the country, around the world, some folks spent their hiatus um going to conventions and celebrating this incredible comeback of Star Trek. Uh, you know, and there's there's little unease around the world. We are out of a pandemic for the most part. Do all the things. But um, it's, it's gradually feeling a little bit looser, but it is a different world. There's the economics of travel and events and things are still, you know, a little... A little bit. We're still finding our way, and yet things are reopening. Well, the conventions this year have been fuller attended than last year, as you'd expect. I'm looking at the folks. Oh, I don't know. Uh, Germany just had FedCon. In fact, I know we probably got people in the chat stream today that were there. Uh, a new debut convention. I am so thrilled for uh, Trek Long Island happened a couple of weeks ago. We noted that. You know, just last weekend, Phoenix Comic Con happened, and I was there last year. Couldn't make it this year, but all reports are that it was much bigger turnout than last year's restart. So thrilled that my, I say, sit on the advisory board for the Nichelle Nichols Foundation, made a big splash. My dear friend Walter just got to talk with him and, and host him in an event for the Nichelle Nichols Foundation. It was virtual. You could check that out if you would for a couple weeks ago. But Walter was there live. Anson, I'm going to mess this up of who all was there. Shatner was there for a day. Um, but Walter hosted the new thing that we started last year or that I was able to host last year. Walter hosted the mixer for Star Trek fans at the con site. And there were other genre mixers. But for the Star Trek one, Walter hosted, there was uh, fundraisers, raffles, all kinds of things. $7,000 raised for the Nichelle Nichols Foundation. And one of the main goals there is sending as many as we can uh, young girls, young girls especially of color, to space camp next year. And that's one of the out-of-the-gate projects before we start funding things like scholarships for, for people who are deserving and often underserved. So yay for my guy Walter, yay for all my friends at the Nichelle Nichols Foundation for having a great event and a great weekend by all accounts. Uh, I'll try to get there Phoenix may be a, a special site in the plans for, for the Nichelle Nichols Foundation going forward. And we'll see what we can do about getting back there next year. But yeah, maybe you celebrated hiatus time going to, or, you know, a con near you. And there are plenty more. I'm just doing two or three here off the top of my head. Um, wh wh who just had the beam in from the Strange New World? It was London Comic Con, right? Uh, the beam in character, the holographic projections from Strange New World cast. And you just saw the news on that. So <laughs> tr 
trying to make up, I think, for some of the... Remember when the Discovery crew all went over to promote Discovery and then the left hand hadn't told the right hand at Paramount Plus what to do and they yanked the... Uh, yeah, that was what? A year ago? Two years ago? Well, again, time takes care of all things. Heals all those wounds. And so, if nothing else, maybe that was a that was a, a little healing touch for the uproar cause last year. But no, that was a big splash. Great promotion for Strange New Worlds, and everybody is excited for it. So, again, maybe you celebrated hiatus past your time by planning, doing all the things, working on your models, working on your cosplay, doing all that. Hey, I'm going to be excited because it's not technically hiatus time, but I'm going to be at SoonerCon in back home with all my homies in Oklahoma City, Greater Oklahoma City, actually Norman, Boomer Sooner. But uh, I'm excited this year because. Um, no actor guests, but, well, for one thing, John Scalzi is the literary guest, but my good buddy and former former employee, haha, uh, Kevin Dilmore is going to be a guest at SoonerCon. So we'll, we'll have some Larry and Kevin moments <laughs> going back to the communicator days and forward. Of course, Kevin has worked at Hallmark for years, and every year I've done a Hallmark Star Trek catch-up moment here from the ornaments on down at Comic-Con San Diego, or sometimes at Vegas. So the last few years, those videos are up. Anyway, I'm so looking forward to seeing Kevin, uh, this guest lineup that they've got, topped by, with John Scalzi at the top. Uh, voice actors, anime, cosplay, artists. It's, it's a, that's happening the very end of June this year, overlaps to July. So it's June 30th, July 1st and 2nd at the Embassy Suites in Norman, right off I-35 there, South Oklahoma City. Um, you can save on tickets. Hey, if you're in the greater, it's, this is not a local con anymore. They are growing. The word is getting out. It's like a five-state draw now, unless you're really ambitious. And people have come from the East Coast to SoonerCon. But the, the advanced prices are still in effect at SoonerCon.com. Makes sense, right? Okay. Hey, kids 12 and under are free. I keep forgetting to say that. Declare your independence is this year's theme. I think they're bumping into four. But, you know, SoonerCon is very, let me say this, SoonerCon is very representational. It is, everybody is welcome. I know you're saying, oh, it's Oklahoma. No, Norman is a wonderful, did I say this, progressive island in Oklahoma, but the fandom community across the state is what you would expect. And um, yeah, no matter what you're repping, franchise-wise, personally, <laughs> whatever it is, you're welcome at SoonerCon. And so that that tagline this year, the theme, Declare Your Independence, has has layers of meaning, if you get my drift. Um, but yeah, the panels, the workshop, there's performances contests, there's kids track. Oh, oh, and I should mention, if all goes well, SoonerCon this year in the kids programming will be the debut of none other than Cadet Alice at her first convention. And we plan, we have a Dr. Trek and Cadet Alice panel in the kids' room, plan to talk prodigy with her peers, fellow cadets. So <laughs> I may be riding the rims a little bit with that one, but I am so looking forward to that. Anyway, um, yeah, SoonerCon.com, you can get all the information there. I'm so looking forward to that. And of course, yeah, I know it's out of hiatus time. Everything will be busting. If I'm looking forward to San Diego, I've got a panel. I can't tell you the time yet, but I can do that in a few weeks while they juggle the schedule. But uh, we'll be back at Comic-Con San Diego again. Of course, Vegas, Truck Vegas, going to do some events there. Can't wait to see all the new faces and the old as we get back to the Rio. And then we'll see what happens the rest of the year. Uh, working on other things. But, you know, that's out of hiatus time, but that's what's exciting going on. Um. What's, what's going on? What's going on? Well, you know, some people, some people, um, well, I said, mentioned uh, diversity, representation. A lot of people are getting involved in Pride Month. A lot of uh, your celebrity friends on their socials and your fan friends, the, the podcast world, the blog world, uh, they're all getting involved in Pride Month. That's awesome. Um, because it's, especially this year, it seems like uh, that's happening. People are, again, spreading the word about the Emmys voting. What's going on? Oh, yeah. Oh, a lot of people are even helping their favorite shows like Prodigy. Did you see this? I was boosting this. Prodigy was in the running in the animation category. There's awards called uh, the TVI, 
right? No, I'm sorry. Telltale TV. Get it? Telltale TV. Their animation division, uh, Prodigy, was one of the nominees. And guess what? It was popularly voted. And guess what? Prodigy won. This was news uh, a couple of weeks ago and everybody trying to tweet about it. I was boosting Signal. So congratulations to, I know Aaron, Aaron Walke, the Emmy winning, uh, you know, co-executive producer on Prodigy was very proud of that, as was the whole team. They beat out, they had, look at the nominees, Harley Quinn, Bob's Burgers, Bluey. Uh, Harley Quinn was number two runner up to Prodigy. So huge congrats to them for that. And uh, by the way, huge shout out to Aaron and his wife for the arrival of their new little one, Amanda, or, uh, or uh, Ensign Roe, as he was calling her. Oh, I'm sorry, Amanda. Ramona. <sighs> that didn't make sense. Congratulations to Aaron and his wife for their new little one. Yeah. Ramona, or Ensign Roe, as he called her uh, very cutely. And he's proudly posting pics. They've already got her wrapped up in some cadet swaddling. So big shout out to him for that. Uh, I saw him about a month ago and he said, well, my life's about to change. And I said, yes, it is. <laughs> Taking on one more crew like that. Uh, so big shout out to him for that. So no, it's it's been an interesting hiatus. What's, um, what's going on with you? What have you been doing? What are you looking forward to? Again, we're ostensibly the end of hiatus will be the product, the uh, Strange New Worlds come back. You know, Lower Decks is lurking out there. And ostensibly, both animation shows, both of the animateds are not affected by the writer's strike. So they should, for the most part, be on, on, on track. Um, we've got Star Trek, as we've talked about here. We've got shows in the can all the way through. The final season of, of Disco is even being delayed until spring. But we've got a Strange New World season to go. We've got a Lower Decks season to come, and it's summertime normal. We've got Prodigy on the way, season two. They, they're double size seasons. It may not hit us until Strange New Worlds next year and the debut of Starfleet Academy, which really is bumped into a 2025 year. And talking to folks on Strike Day, if nothing else, that was always kind of the idea. So the huge advanced lead time on these shows is still a factor. But yeah, the strike's going to impact that um, to a big degree. Um, now, as I said, some folks spent their hiatus walking those picket lines. And if you hadn't listened, hadn't been paying attention, I, I started to tweet just at midnight a couple of nights ago, There'd been a lot of talk about a triple whammy here because, again, this is not just about numbers. It's about the, the landscape of how media is delivered and paid for. And out of the blue, streaming took over. So all the old models, the old residuals with reruns and the way everything was set up was kind of meaningless or it was meaningless for three-fourths of the market. And that's affecting even the global numbers. Well, the DGA... Uh, came in an agreement, settled. So there will be no triple whammy strike this year. Uh, it was an interesting reaction. People were happy for their colleagues, but at the same time, a lot of the writers and a lot of the actors felt a little betrayed, like they were going to stick together. But that begs as, as many overlapping issues as they had, the three unions and the uh, simpatico, the in sympathy, you know, solidarity with the Teamsters and the IOTSI crews who are everybody from grips and, and gaffers through all the art, all the art division, all the art uh, disciplines. Um, they busted out and had an agreement. Now it still has to be approved. And I've seen even chatter that a lot of the hyphenates, the writer directors or even actor directors are not happy about this. And they did make some, some moves. What was ironic was a lot of the things that, that uh, the producers had, refused to discuss with the writers like residuals and how to count them, how to track them, the global numbers, the transparency on all this, that they either didn't talk about at all or gave far below what they wanted to make up for the, the, the shift in revenue. A shift that means that since there's no business model to track and collect it, the profits have been huge and incomes have been down. 
uh, they're basically, you know, uh, making money on this, taking advantage of the fact that there's no infrastructure in place that's really adequate to that's realistic in today's world. The last five years, since especially since the pandemic. So that's the thing. And a lot of hyphenate directors who are either actors or writers or all three aren't keen to deal. So that's not a foregone conclusion. But the directors settled, negotiated, showed their points, some of them. But of course, a lot of their issues didn't involve staffing rooms and mini rooms and a lot of the issues that the writers had. And the writers and actors are both concerned with that, but also concerned with the residuals. But even more so with the whole AI question and getting out ahead of it at first. The directors got a concession from the producers that said basically AI will never replace human involvement. Human involvement can never include AI, which is kind of, depending on how you interpret it, a restating of what the writers specifically wanted, uh, spelling it out. No AI in writer's rooms, no AI, no, no writer's human material used to train AIs, et cetera, et cetera. So that was Monday night. Ironically, the next day was the last day of voting for the SAG after it, the Actors Union strike authorization. Now, not a vote to go on strike. Their contract ends the end of this month, June 30th. What they just did was exactly what the writers had done, mainly to bring more clout to the bargaining table because they had been bargaining for a few months. But basically they said, if we do not have a contract by the 30th and a good faith, we, we have a, you know, in the moment decision. Oh, we just need another couple of days. We're so close. We just need two or three more days or four days. But if there's, if things are hanging and there's no forward momentum, that's a strike vote. And guess what? I think the writers were like, a 98%, 93% turnout to strike. Well, the the writers voted basically at 98% with a half half of the whole union turnout. Now, you might say, yeah, it's only half the union, but there's SAG members everywhere and they are sprawling. Somebody pointed out that the last time they had a contract vote and they approved a contract, only a fourth of the membership voted. And of course it passed. So this is like double... <laughs> It's almost like normal American voting patterns, but almost half of the membership, which is insane. It's the biggest union of the three by far. You know, there's more writers and directors and there's far more actors out there than there are. And, you know, and 99% of them are, are not the glamour boys and gals. So just bear that in mind. Neither, by the way, are the writers, which I thought was a foregone. I keep seeing references to elitist writers. That's part of what this is. Their incomes have been bled dry. If they're a writing team, if you see a writing partner team, they get one one person's slot and they split everything from pay to residuals to everything. That's why me and my writing partner on our one Voyager episode, you know, those checks, those checks every four weeks are for are for 10 bucks, not 20 bucks. So, oh, what it could have been if I'd been solo. No, I'm kidding. But that's a that's a that's a fact. That's it. Um so you've been hearing about all the issues, but that's been a shakeup now. So the writers are pressing to move on. The actors, though, as has was looking certain, the actors are more spooked about the AI as much as they are residuals. But that's still a big question, the money question and other issues, too. But they did just voted overwhelmingly to show their tone. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Well, so there's at least the possibility of a double whammy strike. IATSE and um, Teamsters, as opposed to even the 07 strike, have been very much in solidarity here. And um, we'll see what happens. Now, none of them are up for... IATSE just settled their contract a year or two ago. But it, this is sympathy. They're not crossing... For the most part, Teamsters aren't, aren't driving trucks on when they see picketers, and in New York as well. In fact, it was probably more vicious <laughs> in New York more resolved. So, you know, some folks have spent their hiatus on the picket line and our Star Trek hiatus is going to end in a week. That's one hiatus that may be going on for a good deal longer. We'll see. Um, again, I've seen, some, we had a, our topic last week here was about uh, some of the trolling. Um, you know, a lot of folks, it's, it's, I, I don't think somewhere between the globalization and the pop culturization of especially TV, you know, some of these issues 
they're not about the film side. They're about the television side, the small screen, the episodic. And as as the proliferation of you know big TV, cinematic TV has has proliferated, and some would say that's been part of the problem here that the streamers have thrown so much money on the wall to see what sticks. There's wonderful entertainment out there that people simply haven't had time to catch up with. They may not see it for five years and know the entire extent of the show. But there's been some quality stuff out there and people, but but that that closeness and social media adds to that, just the sheer number of shows, the closeness people have and the proliferation of conventions and comic cons you know, just beyond, you know, hardcore sci-fi. Well, audiences are feeling more in tune. And I think, I mean, I was reading one writer's story from the 81 strike, the one that um, Leonard Nimoy's famously, you've got photos of him in 1981, uh, which is even before the 87 strike, the writer strike that affected Next Generation. But no, um, talking about how people would still drive by and spit, throw eggs at picketers around Hollywood in, ta in a company town and still do that. And I think a lot of that people understand that it's not, oh, those elitist Hollywood writers, that the bulk of those, those people walking the lines are just middle class writers watching, feeling like they're being taken advantage of. So that's part of this, watching those CEO and from the tech side, when you've got the tech studios, not the old school brick and mortars, but the, or they've been taken over. So a lot of this is directed at, yeah, Netflix and the treatment they've had. Um, all the producers are in one bargaining side. They can't splinter off. Although one tactic, they're, they're free to do separate deals. And one tactic this week was the Writers Guild writing letters to uh, Apple TV and trying to what pull out one calf from the herd get one stray over um, you've seen letter writing campaigns to the shareholders of some netflix was it uh talking about why are you approving these exorbitant ceo packages when what the writers are asking for that studio is just a sliver a sliver and you saw shareholders uh turn down the proposed cushy you know ceo packages so maybe we'll run some of these links. Uh, this is starting to sound like a Portal 47 roundtable for the Portales here when we're getting into the weeds and nitty gritty. But if you're if you're curious, and again, if you've had nothing else to do during your Trek hiatus, there's been plenty of news to follow in, in this soap opera. And I don't say that lightly. I, it's, this is life and death for a lot of folks uh, and their pensions and their health care and uh, people starting young families. Uh, just want to do what they do and want to be able to to live in the town where they're doing the work, which is part of it too. Anyway, um, yeah. So what did you do in the Star Trek hiatus? I say that there's another week to go. There's probably some conventions this weekend. There's still some activity. Oh, Monster Palooza was last weekend too here in Pasadena. Um, I, I, but we could go forever remembering the, the cons that have happened in the last couple of months. But uh, yeah, share what you want to do in, in the chat. Maybe you've got some stories to tell too. I will be back in just a second. Let's let's um, let's look for those of us. You know, some folks are not watching us live. They're only watching uh, hi, watching later on YouTube. So I hope maybe someday you can catch us live here. But either way, you'll be leaving us now. And I just want to say a huge shout out as always to our TTLers: Diana Hopkins, Robin Wilson, Lawrence Todd, Anne Marie Siegel, Justin Porteous, Galinda Bruton. Chris Jiggins, Pranakasha Productions, Comedy Forecast, and Andrew Jasimski, and our live wires. Yay. Robert McLean, Byron Bailey, J.R. Poole, Habyard Gun Johnson, Alan Hoenzi, Dave Gregory, Tobias Rex, Donna S. Runyon, and Casey Shafsky. <laughs> hey, Casey. Uh, there you go. Thanks, everybody, for, for being a supporter. Um, what am I trying to do? I'm just trying to tell you that no. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to tell you <laughs> that our Patreon is at patreon.com with our $5, $10 um, uh, levels. Very simple. A shout out every week. The $10 get access to the first generation of Portal, uh, the first two or three years worth of Portal 47 behind the scenes interviews. And you know, we'll string that along as the years go by too. But uh, there's a lot of good stuff there. A couple of folks have actually left us since then. 
So thank you all. Thank you all to the Patronistas. I want to remind you too, it is summer. In fact, we're we're here. Hiatus time means for Trek means you might be glued to your TV on the road because you're traveling. And if you're in LA, if you're out here in Hollywood for business or for family vacation, whatever, set up in advance. Get with me in advance for a Trekland Trek, your own custom away mission. We'll go to four sites, Star Trek film sites that you pick out. I'll coordinate with you, pick you up at your hotel. We'll do four sites, have a fast food lunch. You know, you pick it. The Trex is your custom pick that I help you with ahead of time. And then we wrangle whatever you want to wrangle. Your camera work, your cosplay, your action figures or stuffed animals that get into whatever it is you want to do. And, you know, you, a couple, a threesome, foursome, we'll handle the size. If it's if you if you walk in with a, a family of eight <laughs> or your whole club comes, we'll rent a van and get it for you. Okay. It's that's in the price. So look forward to that. It's been kind of a quiet year. Uh, I feel like the traveling is just around the corner, including if you're coming into town for, say, a Southern Cal for Comic-Con San Diego in July. All right. All right. Um, otherwise, I also want to give a shout out to Star Trek Explorer. My column has been in here for over 20 years. It's kind of amazing. But now we've added fiction since the reboot with Explorer name. This is from Titan in the UK. It's been the official U.S. magazine yeah, since the communicator went down in 05, 06. So a lot of good stuff. My friend John Freeman is back in his second stint. The guy that got me into Titan magazines. <laughs> Whoops. In the 90s has actually come full circle. He's back as editor now. I feel like the queen with her prime ministers. I've seen so many editors across the years, all of them good folks at the Star Trek Titan magazine. And of course, of course, if it's a Tuesday, that means it's another day for the Trek files. It's up. We're back with the great Ben Robinson, formerly of Eagle Moss, currently getting the little ships and the book lines restarted. But he's in as a civilian this week talking about another fun topic, a lost pitch by Bob Justman. Was he a writer? Yes, he was a writer. Well, Gene may not have ever recognized it as such, but he certainly pitched stories. You'll recognize this one, maybe. <laughs> Check it out at the Trek Files, wherever fine podcasts are caught. But of course, on Facebook at our page, you can get the documents of the week. And yeah, we actually have real files to go with our Trek Files. So thanks, everybody, for supporting the Trek Files. We hopefully will have some news to come after our next hiatus on the Trek Files. But we're in the middle of our 10th season. Uh, no let up there yet. Whoa, so much happening, so much going on. What am I missing out on? Oh, you know, if you want to catch up, just keep up with me at Larry Nemechek on Twitter, okay? And Mastodon. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Please go and subscribe. Boy, my Mary Chifo little 10 second reel has just, it's insane. So I don't know. Maybe you're here because of that today. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, like and subscribe to the YouTube channel always. And, you know, Trekland uh, Portal 47.net is where we have a monthly mini con all year long. If you think this is something, uh, wait till you join in with the Portales for our guest nights. We've had some awesome ones. Um, yes. And our roundtables and everything out of my. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Check it out. You know where to go. Um, and the T Public store is over there too. That's going to do it for now. If you're live with us, just hang on. If you are leaving us from YouTube, though, hey, everybody, please, 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 uh, you know, just do all the things. Stay healthy, okay? Uh, stay woke and check the sources before you spend too much time spewing about something that looks ridiculous or wondering if what you're reading is really the truth. Do a little research. There's a lot of insidious YouTube stuff happening now with they'll do a eight presidents that blah, blah, blah. And then they'll slide one in that's totally bogus. I mean, it's they're sneaky. As Will said one time, you got to watch out. They'll run it right past you. Most of all, everybody. Um, truck well. All right, so let's let's turn this sucker off for the first time, finally. 
And let's look at the parrots. Thanks, everybody, for hanging on. Um, again, I uh, I will... Uh, yeah. Once again, don't forget the uh, Kickstarter is going on for Destiny's Aurora. Destiny Aurora. This is a wonderful... Now, the comics have been out. So what you're getting in this Kickstarter for the perks and what it's funding is the new graphic novel, the audiobook, and several other aspects of the looming Destiny Aurora franchise. But uh, this is number one. Here's number five in the plastic. Uh, those were covers. Um, yes, and we've got the uh, got the link to go. Boom, there it is again. Let's look at the parrot analytics just to see what's going on as, as we're in this in-between time with hiatus time. So, you know, the parrot's a way to try to get an, a handle on the digital the digital ratings that kind of left the old Nielsen's behind when we got away from, from uh, commercial terrestrial broadcasting and went to streaming. It's the same revolution that's behind all the issues in the current strikes and all the labor. Every, the world had to change. Um, it's not about changing percentages because the what you're basing on is is moot now. So um, here we go. So yeah. So the Parrot Analytics a company out of uh, New Zealand. It's been what ten years now. They've been in the states. We follow them since the beginning of Discovery, trying to get a handle on this because you don't have the traditional Nielsen ratings, right? Well, ten do see. Shows that are actively dropping and being fresh, that's when they're spiking. They use a mnemonic called Average Demand Expression. It's measuring weekly in this country and in countries all over the world. Parrot's huge. Um, they're data mining <laughs> the, the internet to see, to, as a gauge of popularity, as basically a, a sophisticated form of buzz. And they get terrestrial numbers when they can, but that's it. Now, in the digital side world this world, this week, um, the last time we checked, they're two weeks behind because they're selling off their recent numbers to some of the websites like TV Geek. But uh, finally, two weeks ago, Picard was still hanging in at number 10, in the top 10 out of the five or 600 shows. They're not too far behind, but now the top 10 is Stranger Things at top, Ted Lasso, The Mandalorian, Titans, You, Mrs. Maisel, Bridgerton, The Witcher, Letterkenny, and The Orville. The Orville, that's interesting. I wonder why they spiked. Um, yeah. Ah, Chad Coleman's interview where he talked about the importance of the Orville for the LGBT community. That's what they're pegging it to. Interesting. Interesting. Um, we're still waiting on season four for that. We're still waiting on season three for Prodigy too. So... We'll see how that goes. Um, that's the top 10 of the digitals based on their average demand expression algorithm. If you look at the overalls, though, uh, under the Parrot system, where'd you go? Yeah, The Flash was number one. SpongeBob, South Park, Game of Thrones. Stranger Things is that, and Ted Lasso, the only two digitals in the top 10. Now, we say top, then Succession. Succession? Must not have a talkie show with all the media flack around succession. And it's only been, well, this is two weeks old. We'll see what happens. The Voice and Saturday Night Live, which is still off for the writer's strike. So Picard on these aged two-week-old trends is losing its popularity. But here's the thing. They classify the top 4% as an exceptional show. Then the next 2.7% are outstanding. That's where Picard still is, even if it, its trend line is down 42%. But it was so huge that it's still in their outstanding or second tier category, the top 2.5% of all shows at 27. Now, that was a couple weeks ago. And then talk about the divergent, you know, who's, who's doing this? Wait, coming down, going up. There we go. Now, Strange New, two weeks ago, was sitting at 21.9 times more popular than an average show. And on the rise, 7%. So they're coming up, going down. Picard, more recently, according to TV Geek, had a 35 demand. So it's dropping off, but it's still high. And 
Yeah. And you can tell that, and Strange New is at 28. So Picard's coming down easily. Strange New is creeping up as you'd expect. Now, things have been ramping up here the next, the last week or so. We'll see what impact all of that has on, um, on the parrots. So, whew, that was kind of, I felt a little more newsy roundup there than usual, but it's been that kind of time. I always ask that question, how are you going to spend the hiatus? How will you survive without your weekly big hardcore Trek fix? And it feels like that's gone between Picard being so hot with so much coming out about it and Emmy voting. And then the, you know, the procession of trailers and everything coming along for, for a uh, strange new world. Sorry. I went to the Bahamas for a second. Um, that's something. So let's scroll back and see. Uh, I'm curious to see what everybody's done. What you have done for our hiatus time. Maybe you have a cotton story from the road. Maybe, maybe we'll see. We'll see. But it's good to see everybody. And um, good point. Good point, Nathaniel. Uh, D-Day, the 6th of June. And Jimmy Doohan famously lost his finger. Famously protected by what was his brother's cigarette case in his chest pocket or we might not have had our scotty all these years absolutely absolutely um oh melanie we got you over to youtube huh okay okay so did everyone see did everybody catch the video when we finally got things all teed up Okay. Okay, I'm I'm chat looking here, chat scrolling, and um, oh, hey, Galen, uh, they have both of the other unions. Of course, the actors are still technically negotiating. They've got their strike authorization vote to as a card to put on the table, a very big card to put down on the table. I saw one person, one, one of the actors, probably one of the writers say, ah, well, the DGA settled thanks to the writers taking a stand. In other words, see, there's a lot of new players on the producer side. It's not just that, oh, these tech companies are taking over the studios, you know, and Netflix got involved and Apple got involved in a smaller skew. And, and, you know, Hulu and, and uh, Prime, it's not just that, it's that where they're coming from and that the emphasis is on growth year to year and not just are you having a profit year to year. Because when the emphasis is on growth, last year's not good enough. You've got to be bigger numbers, not just be in the black. And so you're there, you know, like, when, at what point do you, you know, chop up the furniture and throw it in the boiler for the steamboat race? At what point do you start just, you know, dismantling just to have money coming in for revenue? And that's what the Wall Street financial mentality is that a lot of people are decrying. I've got a couple of posts I want to forward that really kind of explain that really simply. It's just not just about writers wanting to be rich. It's about the future. And if you heard some of the writer's assistants I talked to in the on the strike day, the Avi from uh, who's coming up the ladder, it's like that's just that process is destroyed. They're going to eat their young and then in 10 years wonder why they have no producer, why the TV is crap, because they didn't raise producers in the interim to run shows or they're expecting one person to run an entire show and write for it. And we've gone back to the days of, you know, Gene Roddenberry freelancing on Have Gun Will Travel, except there's, you know, it's all freelancers and one poor guy. We've gone back to that. And if you go back to the status of most TV in the 50s and 60s earlier, you're not going to see too many classics. You get one classic drama, one classic comedy, and a bunch of dreck. <laughs> and then that one classic comedy or drama quickly burns out because they've burned out the showrunner. Yeah. Uh, let's see what's going. So, no, it hasn't. They've both said, okay, that's, you know, they praise their, their brethren for having a deal officially 
some of the rank and file grumble a little bit about. They feel like they've been stabbed in the back because they were all going to be unified this year. But a double whammy, the actors and writers is still the bulk of the numbers. And um, again, it hasn't been approved yet. The jury is still out on if there will be a lot of people feeling like maybe their leadership raced too far ahead. Now, what also ticked off the writers is what they were saying. They struck for the issues and the DGA reaped the benefits. As in, it's the smallest of the three, big three. It's the smallest union. And a lot of the things the writers raised that the producers wouldn't talk to them about, they talked to the directors and, and got a decent settlement on it. Even talking about international streaming revenue and some of these some of these pipelines that didn't even exist to talk about the last time or were on the or on the radar. Everything has just exploded so much that streaming direct, you know, as a consumer and a viewer, you know. You know where streaming came out, you know, 10 years ago, like, whoa, what was this? It was just shocking just to have HBO having the Sopranos. And, oh, there's a, a premium channel is going to win Emmys. That's wild. Yeah. Um, eight, six, seven, five, three, oh, nine weeks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, very good, Mona. You've been watching a lot more videos of people talking about treks. You watched the latest Cadet Alice today. So cute. Thank you. I've got another one ready to go. Those are those have been in the can for a while. We need to finish up the season. I don't know if we'll do it on the road or not, but there you go. But thank you. She appreciates that. Uh, hey, Maria, you're in from Brazil with us. Absolutely. Yay. Good to see you. Are you going to try to make it to Vegas again this year? To the real Vegas at the Rio, whatever shape it's in. Oh boy, on the Jenny scale of time. Uh, there you go, Marina. And I haven't got to talk to you really about it much. Absolutely. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. And I'm glad that it was not only lovely, but it sounds like they will survive to con another day financially. So that's the other thing. Um, Well, there you go. Hey, do all the things, Doralta. Do what you need to do. Uh, hey, Mona. You know what? So would I. So would I. <laughs> uh, hey, Christoph. Here, I knew the FedCon report we'd get at least from Christoph. Got to meet John Delancey. Dirk, because they lost half of your early bird ticket data set, they handled it superbly well. Oh, good. Cairo and more. Not Dirk Benedict, Dirk, um, the head guy of FedCon. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Scott. Here is the link to my conversation with Walter Koenig. Every month, the, the foundation has a Halig Frequencies open. Get it? Uh, a virtual panel, a virtual interview discussion spotlight on some aspect of Nichelle's life and legacy. And this time, it was just simple reminiscing with Walter Koenig, uh, talking about his good friend. And they were... They were dear friends. They were probably, I mean, there's a, I, I think I could say that probably Walter was closer to Nichelle than he was with any of the rest of the cast in, a, in, in any time over the years. And um, might have been the reverse too, although Nichelle and Leonard were very close too. But anyway, um, the, the little five banded together in many times. Um Let's see. Actual questions, everybody. Actual questions. Thank you, Christoph. The hollow thing was in London at LFCC. And Christina Chong from Strange New Worlds was at FedCon. Playing up songs from her album on the phone. Oh, awesome. Okay. Well, here we go. Uh, what? First time since, since Brent, much less Leonard, that we've had cast members with albums? Maybe. Interesting. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, thank you, Marina. I had not seen this. But so, so many congrats to Edwin and the team. Edwin and Sophie, I think. Uh, there you go. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, his Red Shirts novel. Right. How do you walk the line there of being, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge? without being licensed. 
But uh, good point, Nathaniel. Yeah, we're all waiting for that. Uh, oh, well, here you go. The Yeah, the London Comic Con. Oh, and Amcom. Sorry about that. Oh, and here we go. FedCon is putting some of their panels up after the fact. There's the YouTube address. Thank you, Christoph, for that. Uh, and thank you, Maria, for the next installment of the Nishan Nichols Foundation Speaker Series. Now, eventually, we're going to have these be live, which would mean, I know, travel. And at least, in a, you know, and maybe they will hop around the country in different locations, not just be L.A.-based. But for now, since we've got the gift of virtual, it makes sense. And and while the foundation is is launching and getting its, you know, its portfolio together, so they can fund some of these projects and aims. So uh, yeah, Portal Forty Seven live dive at Vegas, absolutely. We'll see if we can get to come by this year. Um, this was which con did this? I heard a con in, unfortunately, in Rochester, New York, that was at an un, that was at an ice skating rink that was, I mean, compatible for having the event, and it was under publicized. I saw JG posting about this. It wasn't quite a con of wrath, but it felt it was just an un, uh, one of those unfortunate ones. Uh, yay, heart for prodigy. Yes. The uh, Teletales TV animation winner for 19, for 19, for 2023. Uh, wow, gosh, Scott's so on the ball here. It's the Cadet Alice Talks Prodigy playlist with the newest episode up, in case you didn't hear. If you were all caught up, we did post a new one, and there'll be a new one uh, in the next week. Um, wait, what did I what did I miss here? What did did I miss something? Okay. Um, yeah, I know. I actually thought of this, Glenn. You're just scaring me. Bluey was how Uhura said blue when she was relearning how to read after Nomad wiped out her memory. Yes. Um, yes, the new cadet. Yeah, Alice is like senior now compared to Ramona. Yes, she is cute. So again, follow Aaron's socials. You'll get a lot of Prodigy news and Star Trek overlap news. And apparently maybe we'll have the latest Sean Cochran is another one that's had, he's had two kids, got married and had two kids since he came to Discovery, the first year of Discovery. Time is passing, people. Time is passing. Um, oh, my God, yeah. Only eight weeks until Vegas. Oh, my gosh. Yikes, 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 yikes. Um... Oh, that's right. The advanced screening of Strange New World Season 2 coming up this weekend uh, that you all are getting in New York, right? Um, hey, by the way, everybody, Season 1 of Strange New Worlds until the end of the month of June is streaming free on YouTube. All 10 episodes of just go to the Paramount Plus channel on YouTube and you, you can get to all 10 episodes. I think they're commercial free too, actually. Not even a Paramount uh, bumper, whatever. Um, well, it's not so weird. It's sad, Kristoff, but it's not so weird. We're all complaining. Uh, and it's and don't jump on the licensing people. They're only they can only do deals with people who are interested. It's the slow motion rollout of Prodigy. It's, it, you know, it's one thing for live action, but the animated series, at least there's been three years of Lower Decks, and it kind of makes a punch, and it's in that adult sort. But Prodigy started off so gentle, and it's really picked up momentum, but this strung out, uh, you know, the uh, COVID attack on Picard and delays is, and, and on Discovery, is why that first season was chopped up so much. They used prodigy to fill in the gaps when disco had its problems had nothing to do with prodigy it wasn't the main it wasn't the battle plan out of the gate it wasn't the manual at all um yeah and you know who's the most frustrated about it the team the staff they've got no control over how and when and where it's shown or the 
but toy companies are stepping up. So, um, yeah. Well, Mona, this is exactly, exactly. Streaming, yeah. AI and streaming. And then you had the pandemic on top of it just to get things out of the gate, kind of masking the effect of the revolution that was happening. Yeah. Well, this is true. Oh, Mona, you got it there. If the actors and writers are on strike, how many directors are going to be working anyway? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the impetus is there, you know. Uh, hey, KK Watchest Witch. <laughs> did you stick around or did we bore you to tears until we got around to saying hello? Uh, well, yes, that's exactly the way I planned it, Glenn. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Christoph, I'm not complaining at all. I'm kidding. Sometimes it might even be, it depends on what deal they did to show Voyager somewhere in the world. I mean, that's all it is. I mean, there's a little break down there, but yeah. Yes, three, maybe three times a year. Maybe it's not quarters, at least twice a year, but sometimes three times a year if there's been any money. It, uh, yeah, it's a nine dollar. We did, though, get one check one time for less than a dollar. And Janet and I had been over to the residuals bar. We came in with our, I took a, took a Zuma, I took a shot of it, scanned it to keep it. But then we took our checks over to the residuals bar in the valley, uh, North Hollywood or Studio City, um, and uh, got free drinks for our two dinky checks. Absolutely. Uh, oh, Mona. Well, thank you. I, I, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> Is this a good thing, Mona? Uh, but I, very good. Thank you. And maybe you can share that in your circle then. Good deal. Um, what we got looking for, um, I think I just answered this. It's a little bit irregular, like I said, at least twice a year, but sometimes three times. I don't think we've ever, since the since the hot days, since like the 90s, I don't think we've had like quarterly checks, but I can say there. Um, and so when I was at the strike this time and met, um, met the guy in the blue sciences lower deck suit, was his name Juan? Um, I thanked him. He worked in the in the Writers Guild office, and I thanked him for the smooth delivery all these years. Never had a hiccup with anything. It never had an issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, Marina, as I said, you and me and all of fandom and all of the show staff. Yeah. I keep hoping that it, you know... It, even Nickelodeon's showing is restricted. They can't show season two until so many, they can't show their episodes until uh, some certain amount of time after the showing on Paramount Plus. But eventually, eventually having, them, and they show them at Friday night on the linear schedule. Uh, 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 uh. Well, Mona, I think this is a plea that everybody would do, especially as I said, as audience have gotten more invested in the numbers as much as the quality of t I keep seeing people talk about how TV is so much crappier than it was 10 years ago. And I'm like, really, really? <laughs> I thought the cry was that the level of it was cinematic and the production and writing and that there's so much good TV out there. People can't keep up. I thought that was the knock on the current days. Mm. Uh, hey, Sean, what are you saying here? We are in the longest drought of Trek films ever, Prime Universe. We haven't had a film in 21 years. Oh, for the Prime, we haven't had a film in 21 years. Well, even, even in the Kelvin, it's going on seven years now. And there'd never been a gap like that. I mean, after they started, obviously. See, I don't even I don't even count the ten, the 70s as not having had a film because it didn't exist yet. The the paradigm wasn't there. You had to invent the notion. And it wasn't for lack of trying. As we know, looking at you, Planet of the Titans, and looking at you, the God thing. Thank goodness for retcon titles. <clears throat> mm -mm -mm. 
Oh, I slipped. Let's see. Let's catch up. Hey, Jared. Good to see you, sir. It's been a while. Hope everything's okay on that big commute that you get into sometimes. Okay. Oh, okay. You got you did uh, Disco Season 2 in the Hades. It's a good watch. I really need to rewatch Disco. Maybe it will lighten my impression. I just I just see it and I think uh growing pains. <laughs> I just think labor pains and growing pains. Uh what? What? Too late. Too late. You're not going to shush us. Congratulations, Jared. Wow. Awesome. Okay. Okay. On the other hand, though, you say, the last destination, Star Trek Germany and Dortmund, did have Prodigy marketing all over the place. Maybe they didn't have anything else. Well, that could be true, too. That could be, too. Um, well, good. See, this is how you start to get conventions in Brazil, Maria. Um, do you have Star Trek friends in Brazil? So you you got to start the numbers. You, you're just out there evangelizing and pioneering. You, you're down there starting the Trek colony. Uh, Scott, you started an Enterprise rewatch since one member of the family hadn't seen it yet. Now that we finished TNG, Enterprise felt like the logical SNW companion. Interesting. Okay. Uh, let's see. And yeah, it really gets good near the end of season five onwards and leads into DS9 very well. Well, yeah, since they overlapped. I was reading somebody the other day that was just shocked to see that there are Maquis stories on TNG. And someone said, well, have you seen the ones on DS9? And I was like, that's right. Well, yeah. It wasn't that Voyager invented them. They were invented for Voyager and then used the existing series to help set up, help launch, which they hadn't done with DS9 unless you count the fact that they created the Bajorans and then just decided to set it there. But you go back, Ensign Row was not created a year before they started working on DS9 in, to, in, to set up that format. They just went with, they wanted a, a prickly, frictionated person in the bridge mix. And that's where Ensign Rowe came from. And the whole Bajoran background came to set up the character of Ensign Rowe and tying into Cardassians who had just been created separately. And that was a, that was kind of a, you know, tying down one big aspect of what the Cardassian friction controversy was all about the Federation. Well, it, a lot of it was centered around Bajor. Absolutely. Um, Let's see. Everyone is chiming in here. So, Christoph, you're going to watch Picard in the next hiatus, and season two will get more story points in season three. Uh, Mona, you're watching Voyager now on season two. All righty. Keep your eye on Jonas. Um, right, right, right. Uh, let's see. Uh, hello, Jim. Hi Jim, are you are you new to us here on Tuesdays? If either way, welcome, welcome, welcome. I th I think you're a new name, but either way, it's great to have you with us. What did you do in the hiatus? Well, you watched the first season of Terry's Twelve Monkeys series. Well, I have thought about that. I it's like, mm. for one thing, you're going to see plenty of people in front of the camera and behind the camera working on Picard season three that were involved with, and even some on season two. Um. Yeah, I need to do that too. I really like to do that. Mm -mm -mm. Um, hey, Steve. Hey, it's Fathery. Been checking out the current Trek comics in the hiatus. They're doing some really interesting stuff. Yeah, and if you saw my, if you saw my video, if you and if you missed the press releases, uh, they've had two Eisner nominations, which is the Oscars, the Emmys of the comics world. Um, you know, named for the first great, the great, 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 uh, golden age, uh, editor of comic, uh, Will Eisner and two for the first time, two, not just one, but two 
Star Trek title and authoring teams have been nominated for Eisner's this year. So uh, that's cool. You can meet a couple of them. But yeah, so the, the bar on Trek comics is really rising and they've tried to be in, as integrated as never before. We'll see how that goes and how that lasts. But there you go. They're really proud. They're very defiantly proud about being real Star Trek and not just, oh, it's just the comics. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. May. Hi, May. What did you do? You went behind the Golden Curtain or in Orinda, California, so celebrating the Golden Girls. Oh, okay. Good on you. Adjacent streams. But very cool. And three actors from Star Trek. All right. On their guests. Uh, yeah, Golden. Well, you know, there's been a Twin Peaks convention over the years. There used to be some Northern Exposure events I never got to go to, but I would have loved to have gone to. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> M. Hi, M. Uh, during the hiatus, been doing what you do all year on, just watching Star Trek. Okay, no rhyme or reason or, or special pattern, but uh, are you new with us on Tuesdays or coming in with a different ID from somewhere else? But anyway, M, it's good to have you with us. Okay, we got a debate on Crusade going here. I'll let you guys have that. Uh, let's see. Glenn, you actually made me stop and puzzle this for just a second. Uh, yes. Oh, hey, analysis. I'm glad you agree with me. Check the sources. You've been reading up on propaganda techniques. Trust me, check the sources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If something doesn't ring true or seems odd, especially if it's something you're vaguely aware of, but not fully. Go go find something, even Wikipedia, unless there's like a big battle, if there's like daily rewrites of something, somebody's hot about something. Um, okay. Uh, well, I'll say hello from the future, Mona, when you see this, or hello from the past, <laughs> when you're watching this later. Uh, mm -mm -mm. Hey, Wade, you know, it's never too late to chime in. Glad you could join us. Um, some interesting stuff maybe at the beginning you might want to rewatch when you can. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Will they dog out some dig out? Some Enterprise Season 5 scripts to fill the gap, similar to how they took Phase 2 scripts for Season 2. Uh, well, for one thing, there are no Enterprise Season 5 scripts. They had story ideas, but they never had script scripts. Nobody was going to commit that much time and and without knowing they were going to get paid. Uh, and number two, it won't be the same because in the old days, they were on the strict you know, fall debut schedule. And now things are loosey-goosey. But not only that, but they're so far ahead that they will make up to, the whole season two um, is done. What you're talking about is the season they're half working on already now that you won't see for well over a year. And that season may be delayed next year unless there's enough compression time that they can they can do double time. Depends on how long the strike. If the strike ends in another month or so, it may not be too much of a of a downfall. If the strike goes on for five months, then yes, you'll see. They'll have the earlier shows done. Uh, but then you know, but then there's rewrites. So um you have an idea for a miniseries about a red shirt. Okay, well, don't tell anybody here because then somebody might steal it. <laughs> Don't do it till you write it down and register it with the Writers Guild. Mm -hmm. uh, this is true. Some of the Phase 2 scripts are still good for Stranger. Could be. Could be. There might be some updating to have to come along, you know. Uh, all right, Maria. Well, when you can get back, we'll see you. 
hopefully things will still be, you know, stable and we'll still be at the Rio and there won't be any weirdness going on. Uh, oh, okay. Shout out for the shuttle pod show, Glenn. Sure. Hiatus. Good stuff to do. They've, they've, I, I didn't think Connor and Dom had it in them, <laughs> but they've really raised the quality. Some of the conversations they've had, you know, and they've gone far beyond the enterprise circle. Um, The Delta Flyers have been pulled from YouTube. Really? Okay, I will have to see what's up with that. Have they have they talked about that? They just had a new episode where they gave me a shout out for prophecy. Janet and I, I guess. Mm. Yeah, Dirk Bartholomew. Yeah, it's been a while. Well, you do all the things, Duralta. You do all the things. Uh, now, what are you saying here? Comedy Four. Over the hiatus, your topic is Trek Podcast. The topic is Trek Podcast. Did some top 10 lists, which had you going back and watching virtually episode of Trek. It was fun. That was exhausting as well. Yikes. You did all that in eight weeks? Um, oh, he does? Avery had some albums? I mean, I, okay. I knew he had the, I knew he had the, I knew he had the talent and the capacity. I didn't know if he had the financial you know, fatigue fight in him to put up with that. But when he was younger, maybe. Uh, cool. You know what? See, this is me. I'm not thinking of... That's right, the whole damn musical cast that cast that show. Uh, yes, absolutely. Anthony's albums. <clears throat> um, no, Justin. Shatner's albums do not count alongside Leonard's and Brent's. I, isn't that a foregone conclusion? Uh, thank you for this news, Christoph. Christina Chong's album will be out June 16th, a day after the Star Trek. Hey, okay. Um, there we go. What are you doing reminiscing with yourself for the hiatus? 32 years since the dedication of the Gene Rodden building. Yeah, we were we were talking about that off camera too. Uh, wait, you were there? Justin, were you there for the building dedication? Or are you talking about just as an audience member? Uh, sadly, that was like, what? Uh, July was wrong. That was four months before Gene passed. And they they kept it. They had him propped up well. It wasn't quite weekend at Bernie's yet because he had some more strokes increasingly after late summer. And then his health just went totally downhill. Uh, hey, hey, Jim. A lot of Brit box and waiting for season two. There you go. Yeah, his office is great. He has a theremin in there. Uh, yeah, he has, he has one of the better, busier offices. Um, Shatner does not sing. He makes audio books. Good point. Good point, Christoph. Um, oh, well, I wouldn't take it too personally because probably the entire world is not allowed to see Strange New Worlds for free. So I should have caveated that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. See, you guys keep me honest. Uh, well, there you go. Oh, hi. Christian, you've been watching a lot of Trek on the two Pluto T on the two Pluto TV channels. There's two. What the red and the blue? <laughs> the old NBC radio. Okay, fine. Um, World War II time. Uh, that's interesting. There's two Pluto TV channels. Okay. Well, there you go. There you go. I've wondered what the what the digital age episodes look like when they try to shoehorn them into commercial channels like are they cutting scenes I, I don't know how if, if an episode runs over an hour much less if it runs over 50 or 48 minutes what they do with that extra it's it's just cut i guess i wonder how much it butchers the shows then mm -mm -mm. uh there you go rose a mixture of trek and a lot of cinema uh there we go there we go uh, Trek culture who culture are amazing creators. 
uh yeah sometimes they kind of run a little rough shot over some bits and pieces or they haven't checked on their pronunciations but no they're churning out they're churning out a lot of good stuff and getting a lot of fresh eyeballs who have no idea into that mm -hmm. okay 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 um a question analysis has star trek ever been used as propaganda by any government well i i don't I, you know i can't speak for europe and asia i'm i'm just trying to go to america here to the us and i don't think I'm going to say, you know, like over the years, individual candidates might have tried to do something. And of course, at times the cast and the studio get involved in, you know, public service things. But as far as you know, like hardcore propaganda for political purposes by even more than one person, I don't know. That would be fascinating to track. Of course, all kinds of things around the world could have happened, and especially before the before the digital era, before the social media era. Lots of things could have happened in a vacuum, in a cave, and the rest of the world not know. But then again, you'd have to think that there was enough Trek audience in that location for it to have, like, why would somebody bother? They could come out and do their Spock parody to make a point about a current policy, and if nobody's a Trek fan, then what's the point? The CIA using Star Trek for some purpose? People have looked at the military and others have looked at aspects of Star Trek and said, how can we adapt that or use that? Or where'd you get your idea? You know, or NASA even or something, or just science. I mean, now we're into the whole communicators inspired flip top cell phones, you know, when pads became iPads. Um, Well, uh, thank you, Duralta. We will get those checks until the day that people still keep watching Voyager. <laughs> until somebody is buying Voyager and they have and they're not skipping the seventh season or our episode, then we'll get pennies. It may be four people by the time I'm a hundred. But yeah, those checks they track that. That's what the writers guild does. That's what all the guilds do. They have accountants that sit and track all that stuff. And eventually people do die off and the residuals stop. Mm -hmm. You would easily believe that broadcast TV is crappier than it was TV 10 years ago. Abbott Elementary, Abbott Elementary. Streaming, though, it's light years better. Yeah. I don't watch commercial enough to know what's going on. That's interesting. Glenn says the thing about streaming is that for every cinematic experience like the latest Star Trek live actions, there are dozens of horribly written terrestrial dramas and sitcoms. You know, one of the points that I saw somebody in a pushback make about that is that some of the issues that they are fighting for in this strike, like the mini rooms, like people dismissed without pay, like one showrunner having to write a whole eight episode season series, uh, some of the factors that are under attack right now are a symptom of this, or they're the reason why this is happening, that there's no need for it. Why are some shows where the money is spent, like, I don't know, Mrs. Mav Marvelous Mrs. Maisel is a really huge favorite of mine. The production is, is and the writing, too, and the acting. But, um, but this is exactly, a lot of people say, this is exactly the point. Do I think the God thing would be a good Strange New Worlds episode? Well, you have to find a cogent version of the God thing because it was always in flux and never quite. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, it's sprawling. It it might be too much. I don't know. The you know, um, one of the pocket authors in the late nineties, early aughts, was supposed to make a novel out of all the pieces of the God thing, and they everybody finally had to give up. It was one of the experienced. Uh, uh, one of the experienced Star Trek authors, and um, everybody finally just had to give up because it was just a mess from what was extant, from what was existing of the, of the story. Um, oh, hi, Aaron. I think you've been with us before. Thank you. Um, this isn't your first time, is it? But yay, watching Babylon 5 in the hiatus. It's great. Well, and there's the hoopla about the what Babylon 5 animated movie. Is that what it is? Doesn't SNW sound like someone trying to insult you by calling you woke? Doesn't Strange New World sound like somebody? Uh, I'm not quite reading you here, Sean. Don't know. Uh, I need to read what I've got. Because both this and Planet of the Titans have bizarre, bizarre openings. You relived it. Well, it's an experience. If you can get a, get the biggest screen you can watch it on, though, that's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what you did on hiatus, your 10th fan fiction. Now, you say fan fiction. Is that a story, a novel, a short story? See? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Creator of the spirit. Yes. Uh, another vote for 12 monkeys. There we go. Ah, all righty. You interviewed Trek comic editor Heather Antos on Text Trek a few days ago. She was very proud of their Eisner nominations, as she should be. Rare for any licensed series and unprecedented. For another good point, too. Rare for it because you know the comics are going to be zealous and jealous of comic originating material, and they're going to look askance at something that got big on the screen and it was so big that they sold a licensing deal for comics. They're going to milk the audience for more, you know, this whole thing about it didn't originate organically on a, on a pulp page. I can totally see that. I can totally see that, Father. It's like a syndicated and science fiction show getting an Emmy nomination back in, as, as Rick used to say, the triple, a sequel sci-fi syndicated show. And next generation made history when it did the last season, which was not the best season as they would say. Uh, let's see. Uh, thank you, Donnie. Bye to you and bye to uh, Mona earlier. And let's see. Oh, that's right. Tim Russ has albums too. I don't know how widely they're marketed and how big the label is, but there you go. I don't... Not quite sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, Justin. You were there as guest of Susan and Guy? Wow. Okay, maybe we should talk sometime. I didn't realize, or maybe you've told me this and it's, it's faded away. Are you in a photo? Did you take any photos even with with Susan and Guy? Mm. Uh, there we go. Okay. <sighs> an old song called Shatner on the Mount. Recrept from an old interview. It's incredible. And we're not talking about Captain Kirk is climbing a mountain. Okay. 
Oh, I was not aware of this, Christoph. Maybe this is a foreign, a non-American thing. A hundred online channels, many dedicated to a specific show or franchise. Maybe that's a way of marketing uh, material to a lot of different countries with different languages. All that. Have you? <laughs> Any talk of a 60th anniversary show yet? Well, we have to see what the world looks like by then. It's not quite as cut and dried and systematic as it was for the 50th or even for the 30th. Hmm. No, nope. The Cardassians, remember, and they had the weird helmets. Remember, um, yeah, D Ducat was there, but he wasn't Ducat. Mark Alimo was the first Cardassian gull. Mm. That's the great, that's the wounded. It was all about just um, Captain Prison. <laughs> No, it was about O'Brien and his old captain and that wonderful scene with the moving camera and the soldier boy to the... The soldier boy to the war has gone. In the ranks of men you will find him. <clears throat> nope, nope, not all. Bajorans, they tied the Bajorans into the Cardassians when they invented the Bajorans, but they were not made up at the same time. And the Bajorans were made up to back up the background of Ensign Rowe and not to really launch DS9. It was just within a year or two, they went, oh, well, let's spin off this show and we're going to do the station, not a ship, and let's do this. And so it was like building internally, not, uh, they were using the universe. Uh, was that was that fan servicing too much there? Trying to use Roe and Cardassians and all of that? Go back to Wolf 359 as the basis point? Um. I don't know, Rose, should you watch season one again of Strange New Worlds, all day original series before getting into the Strange New Worlds season two? Uh, I would say, yes, watch season one again. What's it going to hurt? And there's only 10 of them. Not quite sure. Oh, well, I mean, no, I, I have to do a little research unless you've got a, and maybe I'm not thinking of something I should know. Unless you've got a case that you've heard about, we can check into it or you can check into it. Um, <laughs> Starfleet Opaganda, yeah, instead of Copaganda. Hmm, well, that's amazing considering you know, DS9 was just a ripoff of Babylon 5. I say that facetiously, that's my facetious icon emoji. Um, Duralto, there are no stupid questions. How long does it take in average to write a script, a Star Trek script at that? I, it depends on the person. It depends on, you know, are they fresh? Are they burned out? It depends on, are they taking an idea from scratch that they've had and, and basically they're shepherding it all the way? Are they getting handed a story that the group has broke and now they have to take the story document of prose and turn it into a script? Are they, are, you know, sometimes you just struggle what you, you'll hear writers interviewed and talk about, you know, that was the smoothest thing I ever worked on, or, oh my God, I had so many problems with this, or I wanted to do this and my showrunner wanted me to do this and, or we had big fights in the room, you know, so um, you will hear Ron and Brannon basically talk about how they were exhausted and had to write all good things in a month from story break to the final script. And then they had to redo, Michael made them redo the third act because he thought stealing the Enterprise was, was too cute. So they came up with the future three nacelle uh, Enterprise at, being Riker's ship. So that's, it's a little over the map, but if you get, uh, yeah. And then you'll hear the occasional, we're in a crunch and we need something like, like today, tomorrow, the next day. Um, yeah, the ch I've gone blank on the name. The the uh, Riker insanity P 
play story something for, i always think of something for breakfast i can never think of the name of the episode anymore unless i'm into it uh brandon wrote that in just like three or four or five days from scratch from an idea Riker wakes up in an insane asylum was his initial thought and they were behind and jerry said go write it and he like locked himself in a room and did it in three or four or five days um uh, so yeah you get you you know but an average um, that's a, an average would be a month, maybe. Now that was the old days, the days today, that's a good thing to talk to, uh, current writers about, but I'm going in the Berman era, the 26 episode a year season. Oh, I gotcha. What a moron. What a maroon. I see a copaganda. I see my mind went to the Copa. <laughs> Copa Cabana. Uh, thank you, Zahir. What you've been enjoying in the hiatus? West Wing and Only Hoping, right? 1883, Superman and Lois. I never, I never saw the Lois series. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. Uh. <laughs> minstrel boy what are you laughing about the minstrel boy it was a sweet song sweet moment what's wrong with you is it here well in case you hadn't figured it out, uh, Duralta, sadly, everything can be taken and twisted, including Star Trek. So I know what the point is. Talk to some of the rock stars and musicians whose music gets totally misappropriated. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Mark Alimo was one of the two Romulans. What was it TPEC or something or TLEC? The two Romulans you see at the end of the neutral zone. Mm -hmm. He was also the dealer when Data plays his poker game in 1893 San Francisco. Frederick LaRouc or Frederick LaRock or something. Um, yeah. Well, you know what? I can't help that. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> good, good for you looking out for their, their mental health, Christoph. That's good. Well, let's hope he, you know, and Jonathan loves fans and loves people. And if it's, it's for work, it's, it's not his fault. He's a retiree who's still working crazy mad <clears throat> okay we're at the end of the chat uh, okay mm -mm -mm. uh you're still in there pitching questions Geralta. well it people i think people maybe like a half day writing they don't want to burn i mean if they're on deadline it can be brutal but i think a lot of writers try to have a like they put try to put in three or four good hours a day into that and then take a break Maybe they're researching. Maybe they've taken a total break to refresh their brain, you know. Or maybe they work on two different projects of different kinds. But you know what? I think we are. I think we are at the end of the chat as we know it. So once again, let me let me uh, let me run this for you. Uh, let me do that once again. I want to do a shout out. I want to do a big thanks. In the wildly successful Destiny Aurora universe, the release of the audiobook version marks the newest addition to the franchise. Follow the thrilling adventures of the starship Destiny Aurora and its crew as they hunt for the alien assassin who murdered Jace Carver's wife. Their epic confrontation will change Jace's life forever and keep readers guessing till the end. Go to the link below and listen to the first chapter absolutely free.
Yeah. So that his Kickstarter is there. Uh, Destiny Aurora. It's a new franchise. He's uh, Frank is getting launched. The collected graphic novel of the uh, comics. Um, he's run several Kickstarters before. You can see his history. You can go to the GoFundMe and uh, do that. And I think there's the link once again. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for another Tuesday. I've already got some guests. We've got guests coming in the next week or so. We've got Strange New Worlds will be even more on our on our front view mirror. <laughs> does that make us? Does that make sense at all? Does that make sense at all? But once again, hey, I want to thank everybody, all of our TTLers, all of our patrons. It's a fairly new month, so you've got plenty of time to jump in. But I appreciate it when you can. We are slowly expanding our world here at Trekline Media. Who knows what this rest of the year will bring. A lot of stuff we're working on. Hopefully that will come to pass and I can let you know. But meanwhile, right now, thank you. Thank you so much to everybody who's on our TTL team. If you can join up, it's awesome. It's simple. Five bucks, 10 bucks. I keep it very simple like that. If you want to do more, just jump into Portal 47, gang. <laughs> but the Patreon is at patreon.com slash Live. Really appreciate if you could do that. Take a listen. Again, if you're headed this way, or even if you're not, maybe you should come in and join us. Get ahead of me. Get a hold of me. <laughs> Don't get too far ahead of me. We might get lost. Check out TreklineTreks.com. We can pull off your original and customized, your own unique away mission around LA, greater LA. Well, away south and away north. We can even get up to the Picard Vineyard. Uh, that's two and a half hours north of L.A., but that's kind of like the north edge of, of reality. <laughs> Check it out. I'd love to take you on your own day tour of four Trek sites here in the L.A. area anyway. Uh, the Trek Files is up once again. Please check it out. We've got Ben Robinson up this week. He's our guest talking about a lost pitch from Bob Justman, which was never taken, but still interesting. It's a chestnut. Check it out. Uh, the docs, of course, are at Facebook. You can get the Trek Files anywhere fine podcasts are, are caught. And all of the Roddenberry podcasts, Mission Log on Down, are at podcast.roddenberry.com. There you go. And, of course, me around the webs, Larry Nimichek on Twitter and Mastodon. Larry Nimichek's Trekland or Larry's Trekland on YouTube, maybe where you are right now, Facebook and Instagram. You want to get there, too. Portal47.net. Portal47.net is where to come for this experience in depth during the month. Several visits, several mailers all year long. It is like a mini con all year long where no savvy fan has gone before. Still nothing quite like it out there in the Trek online universe or even the live universe, which is the point. I had so many, um, so many good wishes after we did, uh, after we did the backstage, uh, the the Cisco Day, the Cisco Day, we did a backstage DS9 panel. Uh, and a lot of people were saying, this was awesome hearing these stories. I had an assistant director, the stunt coordinator, and, and the lead, one of the chief all seven years stand-in background folks talking stories about backstage, telling great stories about Avery. And people just bowled over this is awesome. We should have more of this. We should have them at conventions. And I said, well, yes, welcome to my crusade the last 30 years and welcome to what portal 47 has been about for the last seven years. So anyway, that does it for today for us folks. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you're watching later, which you're not seeing this now then, but glad you could be with us and glad for joining and spread the word, share the word, uh, check out the store at T public, of course, and, you know, you know, take care of yourself, stay healthy, do all the things, stay woke, check the sources. It may be too crazy to be true because it probably is. And yeah, truck well, everybody. <laughs>